Alrighty, welcome back to the Big Skinny with me. It's the time of the show where we live out our just core principle here to be humble or be humbled in the markets because we know we don't know everything. And I am extremely honored to have a guest with us today who has one of the best track records in tech. I'll argue, um, I'll stack it up against anyone. And she's also made some of the biggest predictions, not just in big tech, but also with big Bitcoin, which we're going to get into in a moment as well. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Beth Kindig to the Big Skinny. Hey, Lou. How you doing? Hey, Thank Beth. you for having me. Good yeah. to have you here. I see you everywhere now, Bloomberg, CNBC, Charles Payne Show. And I'm just going to jump right in. I mean, you you put the bold prediction out there, NVIDIA to a $20 trillion market cap. Help us understand how you get to that and you know why you think it's reasonable and what's the time frame. Sure. $20 trillion market cap by the end of the decade. We were revisiting our $10 trillion market cap original prediction. And I said, wait a minute here. This thing's going way higher by the end of the decade. Felt like I needed to go ahead and let my readers know that. Um, it, there are a couple of assumptions with this prediction, as there is with every prediction. The first is that uh, NVIDIA has about a 25, 20 to 25 forward sales valuation. It would need to maintain that sales valuation. It's maintained that since 2020. That's a reasonable assumption. Secondly, they would need to grow 3x by the end of 2026 to 2030. I have four years for NVIDIA to grow 300%. Now, keep in mind that they've grown uh, their data center revenue I'm talking about here. They've grown their data center revenue 500% from Hopper to Blackwell Rubin, which is about a two to three year time frame. So all around, this is pretty conservative, actually, yeah. considering the stock that I've been following for many years. Yeah, you're, when you break it down, that headline doesn't seem so aggressive when you get into the weeds on it. And I'd argue, mm -hmm. gosh, I hate to say it, it could go even higher than that because a 25 times forward earnings multiple, NVIDIA had, well, traded as high as 30, 35 times before. So it's not impossible for it to go even higher than there. Well, let me ask you this. What are the risks that you see? Let's talk about the Google, uh, you know, they're gonna, other companies are going to start buying from Google instead of NVIDIA. How do you calculate or factor that into your model? Okay, when it comes to TPUs, I want to say they've been out for a decade already, okay? And in terms of uh, application-specific hardware ASICs, that's a different uh, use case than the general purpose GPUs that NVIDIA puts out. Puts out. That can work on any workload, right. any framework, any architecture. That's very different been training something very specific to what your business does, which is what TPUs, what Google's been doing for 10 years, now may, you know, the rumor is they may outsource that to some a company like Meta. That's not a big risk to NVIDIA, as big as the market thinks, because there will always be overwhelming demand for those more general purpose GPUs. Right. So, I mean, I use the analogy and correct me if you think it's wrong or you have a better one is the GPUs are like the Swiss army knives of AI chips where these TPUs or custom chips are more like your pairing knife or a specialty knife where you're never going to use them as much, but therefore they're, they're good to have in, in the kitchen for you. I mean, is that fair? That's a great analogy. You know, it's something like a, like a, maybe a screwdriver where you use it everywhere, but this is more of a specialized wrench or, you know, you would only use it for one job only. Uh, versus a tool you would use in many different um, situations, companies, frameworks, um, applications, things of that nature. And also keep in mind that CUDA software moat. This is actually why I called NVIDIA an AI stock seven years ago. It was the reason I said it could be the world's most valuable company at a 100 billion market cap. It was based on the CUDA software moat, which TPUs will not breach that moat. And that moat allows software developers to program GPUs. It's an extensive library that not only Google won't catch up to anytime soon, but nor will any other company. Yeah, I mean, it's the CUDA moat is similar to Apple's ecosystem. Once you're in it, it's really hard to get outside of it. Talk to me about, I've heard, heard a lot of analysts now saying, well, Alphabet's got a unique advantage because they have the whole stack. They're vertically integrated, right? So they earn some of the margin that some companies would have to give away to NVIDIA. How do you just refute that statement or along those lines that Alphabet has some inherent advantage if they're training and selling the, same, the, the chips on their own? I think Google, my this is what I think will play out. And Lou, we can talk about this again in a couple of years. This is what will happen over the next two to three years. Google will optimize certain workloads with TPUs as they have been. 
they'll be able to save some costs, lower their margins on those workloads. However, they will continue to use NVIDIA for more, some of those more general workloads to really stay ahead on rack scale architectures. Um, rack scale architectures that NVIDIA is putting out, I want to call this, you know, to keep it simple, the product roadmap, the product cadence. Every 12 to 18 months, they're growing their rack scale systems at such a rate that they can, that something like Google cannot keep up with from eight GPUs to 72 GPUs, 244 GPUs to 576 GPUs uh, over the next couple of years, that will be very hard for Google to compete with. Google's goal is to take certain workloads, lower those margins, but to keep building and training and running inference and some of those harder workloads on NVIDIA's, um, NVIDIA's GPUs. Yeah, that makes sense. I've got a question for you because I've asked this to a few other people. Uh, in terms of the availability of compute power, right, where the gate limiting factor is really electricity, right? We need the electricity to power these data centers. Let's say that wasn't an issue and more data centers could come online. Do you see this as something where we'll keep finding new uses for compute power or do we ever hit a peak where we don't need any more high power compute? Where... I like to encourage people to consider how early we are, is we've been in this training phase, which is compute intensive and very expensive, and it's not really the optimal monetization stage. It really inferences. Inference is the optimal monetization stage. So to answer your question, uh, we will see, in my opinion, a more sustained growth period that the market can understand once yeah. we start to monetize. And that monetization yeah. piece is coming. OpenAI is a really good example of that monetization piece based on inference. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, looking at the difference between the, you know, the baseline subscription and the premium sub pro subscriptions, the capabilities are so much better. And then they, once you're in that ecosystem, they're just going to be able to charge more. Question for you along the lines of, are there any other AI names or AI adjacent names that you really like in this market or that really worry you in this market? I mean, you throw out a name like Oracle. Are you scared about Oracle's overspending, debt-based debt spending? Any ideas in that, that, that thread? Yeah, Lou, I do participate in hypergrowth stocks and Oracle has this hypergrowth piece with its remaining performance obligation. I mean, it's giving key metrics that are explosive. However, uh, we are more of a cautious firm around debt, cash. We will participate, but we will use technicals for risk management. We do not close our eyes blindly and just throw money yeah. at the wall. Uh, so Oracle is in one of those gray areas for me. It's not a all systems go like some of the other AI stocks, but it's certainly very interesting in terms of its backlog RPO. And we would just hold a stop on that kind of a position in case the debt continues to exceed, you know, any reasonable amount of cash and et cetera. Yeah, were you involved before that? I mean, you see on the chart here, that huge re-rate that we all remember, it's now pulled back below that. Are you, is this a position you actively own or is this one that you're looking to re-enter? I mean, how do you think about Oracle at these levels? Yeah, we bought, we tried at Oracle and it, I believe it hit a stop and we, we will just try lower kind of thing. Uh, we've been yeah. eyeing it because it is, a, I think it's around that $200 mark. It has come up lately in our conversations because again, it does have, uh, you know, it, it really strong potential and we're, we're one of those types we'll hit our stop and we'll just try to buy lower. Uh, we believe strongly in risk management when you approach uh, a trend like AI. Yeah. So let's talk about entry points, maybe on Bitcoin. I know you are, you're out with a piece. You were very pressing on Bitcoin's pullback when everyone said it was going nowhere but up. Um, what are you seeing now in the Bitcoin market? What would interest you to become a buyer? We own Bitcoin. I do want to make that clear. Uh, we've just risk managed it. So we cut it in half or even 80 percent of the position, something like that. Oh, wow. Our our message overall is try to use a data-driven approach with all uh, sentiment-driven assets, whether that's crypto or these hyper-growth stocks or something like Oracle, where the AI boom is pushing that stock higher, but there are some debt issues under underneath it. Uh, ultimately, we really like to champion that piece, which is use a data-driven approach. And according to us, according to our research and our technicals, it was a good time to, to take some gains uh, you know, when it was above 100, 120, something like that. Yeah. And so talk to me about lower. your, 
Yeah, talk to me about your approach a little bit because I love the the marriage mm -hmm. of the sentiment based early stage hyper growth innovative, but being data driven. It's led you to some incredible performance. We're going to bring up a slide here that shows that you should be in the uh, the Hall of Fame with some of the best hedge fund managers here. So get into the strategy. Really, how how do you come about? What's the core principles that guide your investment philosophy? Active management, I guess, would be the best way to describe our style. What that means is we will take our racehorses, these, these big winners, and we will let them run and we will continually hold stops on them. And if they hit a stop, we will simply buy lower. And by doing that, more times than not, you come out ahead compared to a long term buy and hold strategy. Uh, yeah, so are you, you running tech, on yeah. your stops? Sorry to interrupt you, but are you running like yeah. five to seven percent stops, 10 to 12? What's the how tight are your stops that are allowing you to get out quickly and then rebuy re later on? Our stops are different for every single stock. And I mean, we're, we're big on everyone should have their own form of risk management. We're not financial advisors. People have to right. kind of come up with that on the, their, their own. We do, of course, every trade we put out in real time. So if we've hit a stop, people know we've exited. Uh, that piece in terms of just having some confidence that you could potentially buy lower all as well if you can. Uh, most people, what happens is they freeze up, right? They see their right. stocks down 10, 20%. They freeze and they start to grab on even tighter. We are more <laughs> of the type to let go. And that's our philosophy is to really not hold on tight to losing positions, especially in tech. Now, if you have a value investor on or, you know, another, another sector that can work, it doesn't work in tech. And I feel pretty confident yeah. in that. A mentor of mine always told me, don't fall in love with your stocks, fall in love with your sweethearts. Because if you fall in love with your stocks, you hold on to them for too long and they turn into bigger losses. Um, tell us, Beth, how people can get your research in real time, uh, can invest alongside you. Uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, we, we put out a free newsletter every week. It's really good information. If I'm biased, but boy, do we put a lot of energy <laughs> into that and time. Then secondly, we're holding a Black Friday deal right now. Uh, one of our biggest sales of the year, $250 off our advanced tier. Real-time trade alerts, weekly webinars, deep dives on many AI stocks you may not have heard of. We have Credo who reported tonight up 15% after hours. That's a leading position on our site. Uh, we are uh, you know, in the trenches on the front lines when it comes to AI in a way that I would say very few firms are. Yeah. Listen, I appreciate you making time to share your insights with us, especially on a night when one of your positions is reporting. We'd love to have you back when NVIDIA is maybe at 10 trillion and you get you update your estimates to maybe 25 trillion market cap. Yeah. You got it, Lou. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Beth, for joining us.